When people arrive in the theater to see uh, King Lear, they see a very large photograph of me um, when I was much younger, and sort of the remnants of a banquet hall and a men's room with a gal sitting in there. We call her a feces granny. And uh, this is where the opening scene will take place. He's in very good spirits. He's very happy. He's happy to see his daughters. He's they're celebrating. It's sort of a Memorial Day celebration. And this is the day that he's going to announce how his kingdom is going to be divided up, based on, of course, who loves him the most. This is, again, at the beginning where, where he's, he's sort of showing his patriotic side of his nature, this his is hand over his heart, listening to the anthem that's being sung. Whether you're in Yugoslavia or Serbia or, or Romania, Ceausescu or Tito, sort of a combination. And now he's dividing up the kingdom and he's giving Regan her portion. This is Regan's portion. Regan's portion of the cake, which is symbolic of what the kingdom is. He who loves me the most gets the most. I mean, that's it's, it's a very common theme, I think. A moment where Kent has disputed the king. Lear's advisor, chief of staff, has taken Cordelia's side, saying, you're acting like a madman, you're acting too rash. And he challenges Lear's, uh, what Lear is, is saying, and he comes very close, and then thinks better of it and banishes him instead. Ah, this is one of my favorite. Uh, this is a moment where Lear is listening to his fool, beautifully played by Howard Witt, and uh, you can see there's also a deer in the background, which is a remnant of the hunting, and one of his knights. Uh, and the fool is, is saying, I, I, here's an egg, an uncle, uh, and it's divided into two parts. And I said, well, what two parts shall they be? And he said, well, he said, one part is, is good, and the other part you, you spoil by giving up your, giving your land away to you. So he's always talking in parables. He's always talking in aphorisms. And uh, it's, uh, it's difficult at times for, for the audience to understand. But we know that the fool is really, uh, he's near soul. A licensed fool. As they say. Yeah. He has license. He has, he has the permission to say things that are, in fact, he's obligated to say things, to tell the king the truth, even though it's hard for him to hear the truth. The anger changes from night to night. It depends on, you know, the, the tone varies. The, the, there are fluctuations in, in pitch and, and intensity that happen as a result of what the other actors are doing and also the response from the audience. You, you make a very good point, and that is because you, Lear is given to long rants long, these long sustained diatribes against his daughters, that it be, becomes important, uh, incumbent on the actor to go inside those rants and find the words that are important and find the intonations that are necessary to be accentuated and not just to scream and yell the entire thing, to find the, the moments of exasperation and frustration that also and the anger and the and the and the and the sadness, the the absolute um, the helplessness of being able to express himself as fully as he would like to. And there's a moment where he says to his fool, let, "Let me not go mad. Let me not go mad. No fool, I shall go mad." Yeah, I love that picture. Here's a scene with uh, Gloucester in, in Regan's kitchen. Regan, Cornwall, and one of the thugs are about ready to remove Gloucester's eyes. And now they, there they are taking the eye. It's a brutal scene. One of the most brutal scenes in Shakespeare. And 
beautifully and graphically, I think, portrayed in this production. Oh, I mean, many members of the audience just, they can't, they have to turn away, they can't watch it. It reminds me a lot of the Antoine Artaud, Theater of Cruelty, uh, Theater of Blood. Uh, Shakespeare doesn't pull punches when it comes to brutality, and certainly in this play he doesn't. And now uh, this is just a very graphic scene. Here's Lear in, in, in his sort of homeless guise. It's, he's, he's lost everything now. Gloucester and Lear on the heath. One mad, one blind. Ah, Lear now is, has been captured and has now been put, uh, he's, he's, he's been sleeping, he's been cleaned up, and the doctor's about ready to resuscitate him, and he's now going to, when he wakes up, he's, he'll recognize Cordelia. He's really in, a, he's in a, his own world, he's sort of drifting in, in, in and out of a consciousness. Here we are, uh, these are the, the manifestations of the war, the bodies, the dead bodies. This is the, the, the scene where, we call it the body bag ballet, where ethnic cleansing is, is taking place. And now, of course, Gloucester's body is also thrown away, just like a piece of trash. This is Lear with Cordelia, just let's go away to prison. The last scene, of course, always, I mean, the final scene where he, where Lear is to carry in his, his own daughter is a very, it's a devastating moment. And uh, I, you think about choices that you make in life. You can, you know, it's so easy to make a bad choice and for things to go completely haywire and awry. The best laid plans, the expectations of happiness and security and stability can be tossed aside in an instant if you make a bad decision. And I think about that a lot, I do. Having a young son and daughter and uh, wanting the best for them, of course. And um, so Lear does remind you that it's so easy to get sidetracked in terms of your values. And it all starts with who loves me the most. <laughs>